Hello, my name's Rosalind Price Cousins. I'm one of the business skills coordinators here at the Crafts Council. And today I'm here with Ikta Cole, who is going to be sharing her experience in setting up and running her craft business. Um, she is a textile artist working in stitch making narrative um, maps, which are really, really beautiful. So we're very lucky to be hearing her journey so far. I'm just going to stop sharing this screen so that uh, Itka can talk to you and go through her slides. And um, at the end, we'll have time for a few questions. So I'll hand over to you now. Thank you. Hello, good morning. Thank you so much for having me. Um, it's really exciting to be here talking about my practice, about my creative journey. Um, and life seems to have come full circle because 10 years ago, uh, I was um, an awardee. Uh, the Crafts Council at the time had um, a wonderful uh, business development award called Next Move. Um, and I was one of those awardees. So it feels lovely to be able to come back and you know talk about that journey, how it unfolded, um, but also be able to give back and share my insights um, that I've gained over the last decade uh, and more. Um, just walking on this creative path on my creative journey and I hope that you'll find um, something useful that you resonate with that will help you in your own creative journey. So uh, as Rosie said, I'm a textile artist and I work with Stitch primarily. Um, I make narrative maps that explore a sense of place, of belonging, of history, of identities. Um, and that is really the core of my practice. But I, I'm going to show you um, in um, some slides that, you know, that core kind of um, element of the practice has multiple manifestations and it's possible to explore several different strands um, and still keep coming back to the core that sort of lights you up, that's, that fulfills you and um, moves you forward in your journey as a creative person. So I am going to uh, start my screen share and Rosie, you can let me know if you're not seeing it. So just bear with me one moment. I need to get it back to the starting slide. Yes, it's doing that now. And So that's me. Mapping meaning is, um, is kind of a mantra I keep coming back to. It sort of holds all the strands of my work together. Uh, and it's, it's kind of like, it's uh, something that defines my practice and gives me direction. It's kind of like my North Star. So as I mentioned, I make narrative maps um, based on the history of the place and I explore architecture through it. I explore storytelling. Uh, and to me, they are just absolutely beautiful objects in their own right, but also as repositories of meaning. Um, they are um, storytelling devices and what you choose to have on the map versus what you leave out also is, um, you know, a sort of storytelling. And I love that, you know, there are so many layers to maps, them as graphic objects, but also, you know, the icons that you see on the map tell their own story. And to me, they're, they are like portals to different places. Um, so let me now take you through the different strands of my practice. 
So by strands, I mean all of the different manifestations of the that sort of core of my practice, which is uh, exploring storytelling through maps. Uh, you could also think of them as income streams or um, just the different types of projects that I do. So the first one and quite an important one for me is working to commission. So making bespoke maps um, of places that sometimes exist only in memory or others that are current, contemporary, uh, whilst, whilst many others are based on uh, an abstract sense of the place. So um, these, I work for primarily four types of clients and they are private collectors, they are museums, uh, culture sectors, charities and galleries. And I'm going to show you a couple of examples of these um, as we go through the slides. These are um, map embroidery kits and they are they are basically, uh, I make them in short uh, editions. They're all made in London. And with these, my idea is to democratize the creative process, to give everyone uh, the chance to, to learn how to, to embroider, but also to, to commemorate places that are meaningful to them uh, and celebrate the idea that, um, you know, making things by hand can lead us to a lot of joy and we can share that joy with others by gifting these or, um, you know, exploring and nurturing our own creativity. Then um, I teach masterclasses in embroidery. Uh, and this again is a very important element of my practice because it allows me to, to connect with, um, with people who are looking to explore um, embroidery, but also looking for a, a creating a space that allows them to nurture their creative instincts, to learn new skills, to connect with other like-minded people. Um, and to me, I, I see that as a, a symbiotic process where uh, we are all helping each other in our journey. Here on the right side of the image, you would see some of the collaborators that I've worked with over the years. Um, some really fantastic people that, you know, um, my practice has kind of led me to, and I'm truly grateful for this part of my practice. Um, paintings are something of a new direction for me. Uh, these are still maps and they've sort of grown from a desire to celebrate um, places, but through a different medium. Over the pandemic, um, I did a new series celebrating London's open spaces because I personally felt uh, that I drew so much solace, I drew, drew so much comfort from um, our open lovely spaces, gardens and parks that we're so lucky to have um, in London and to kind of commemorate those I did this series of paintings and the, the painting on the left side of Kew Gardens has recently been acquired by the Crafts Council, which is very, very exciting for the permanent collection. Um, so yeah, I'm really excited about this new strand that has grown and uh, I am looking forward to exploring it more uh, in the coming months and years. I also work um, on public participatory projects in the community and I love uh, being able to do that. And <clears throat> to me, this is a very fulfilling way of um, 
showing up in the world as an artist because it you know instantly makes art uh, or craft or making less elitist it makes it accessible to everyone and everyone can take part in it everyone can experience what it is like to be a creator um, and we all come together as a community. Uh, this particular project is um, was commissioned by Gunnersbury Park Museum uh, to celebrate to celebrate the local area that the museum serves. And I worked with two different groups uh, within the community. Uh, it was a group of deaf and hard of hearing women, and also another intergenerational group. Um, and you can see some of the members um, on the right side and everyone looking so happy and proud uh, for having made, made this map. I'm going to show you what the outcome of this project looks like. So this map of um, West London primarily uh, is now installed in the museum on permanent display and all of these places that the community members themselves chose as being significant to them uh, have been embroidered um, by them and me and all of the volunteers museum staff uh, contributed to in the making of this piece and it fills me with me with so much joy to see it there um, and I embroidered everybody's names along the border, so I don't know, you, you can sort of faintly make out along, along the edges a uh, line of text running and there were about 45 people that took part and everybody's name is on there so they can take a sense of ownership of this, you know. Um, so th that was, you know, one of one of examples of my um, public participatory projects, but over the years I've worked in several. Um, this one was an artist residency at Chinatown uh, Soho that was hosted by a wonderful organization called China Exchange last year. And this just before the pandemic hit, we managed to meet with a lot of uh, community members and get their inputs and insights into what, how, how should we tell better stories of the diaspora, of Chinatown itself, and the fact that, you know, it has been in London since the late 1850s. And this, this map is an outcome of that residency. And now um, it is being sold by the charity to, to raise funds for making more cultural activities possible um, within Chinatown and also um, hosting a lot more um, participatory activities, creative activities within the area and kind of bringing the community into the fold, um, make, making making the hidden stories of Chinatown more visible to not just visitors, but also um, community members that are very much part of uh, the area and have been for multiple generations. So um, this slide shows you some of the highlights from 2020 for me, I mean, for, it was a phenomenal year um, for me despite the pandemic. And I wanted to put it out there for all of you to see and to believe that um, good things are possible. And if we just decide to carry on um, and continue working on our practices and evolving our practices, um, even a worldwide pandemic um, can be can be a validation of our creative journey, can provide us with opportunities that did not perhaps exist before. Um, and it can really allow us, um, you know, to take action to, uh, to, to actually believe in our agency as as creatives to make a difference. 
Um, so lots of collaborations happened, uh, lots of press articles happened, uh, and new people um, kind of joined me and became aware of my work. Uh, and it's kind of just grown and grown. And to me, that's that's a sign that people are definitely looking for um, artists to take the lead in making uh, meaningful work, providing opportunities for connections, um, and also just to just to make a positive impact in the world. So um, I want to talk about talk to you about what really drives me uh, and my creative practice, what gets me excited to get out of bed every morning um, and get down to the studio and make more work. So first and foremost for me is the joy and power of creativity. I think as creatives, we can completely identify with that. It's just so joyful to be making work, to getting um, our hands to handle material, to solving creative problems. Um, but also very importantly for me, to, for that sense of agency it gives me um, over my own life, over the, deciding the course of my own life, um, and that I can make a change happen. The second one is autonomy and authenticity. By autonomy, I mean that for, for the longest time, I mean, even in the days that I used to be a student at my design school, I used to love the idea that, you know, I could be my own boss. I can set the rules and the parameters and I can um, make the decisions as to what I wanted to do and what sort of life I wanted to lead, what success means to me. And by authenticity, I mean that I get to show up as, as the fullest version of myself, you know. Um, I, I don't have to be using uh, a voice that doesn't belong to me. It is very much uh, something that, you, you know, is inherently me, is the essence of me. And I express that through the works that I'm making, but also that the things that I choose to talk about. So those two are very, very important to me. And finally, I think the third part of this is the connection that my practice allows me to make. I mean, textiles, for example, um, to me, textile, working in textile seems like such a huge privilege. It instantly connects me to my mother, to my grandmother, who were prolific needle women, um, and to my other family members who get excited about, you know, um, wearing saris for uh, certain occasions, for, for going to the local <clears throat> artisans uh, and, and supporting them and buying um, clothing that that means something to them uh, personally, but also as, you know, carriers of tradition and uh, values that we, we hold dear. So that is a personal um, sort of take on textiles, but also I feel in a wider sense, you know, um, there are so many people who, who wish to, to kind of tune into more into that connection with the community of others who are excited about textiles, for example, who are excited about exploring different, um, different ways of making textiles. Uh, and it's that connection that I truly value. And I'm so lucky that through my teaching and through my work, I'm, I'm able to, um, to kind of hold a space where, where this is very much in the center. So let's move on to where my story really begins. So we looked at a lot of kind of examples of work. We looked at clients that I'm now working with, but all of this hasn't happened overnight. I mean, I began um, 
my uh, creator journey nearly 20 years ago in the late 90s. And this is my design school, National Institute of Design in Ahmedabad in India. Um, India is where I was born and grew up. And um, then went to this really cool, amazing design school where I learned everything um, that I know. Today it was really uh, the foundation and the campus was beautiful as well. I mean, lots of peacocks, an ancient monument juxtaposed with a, a, a sort of mid-century modern building. And this is where I, I kind of learned the basics of a creative language. Um, you know, a lot of tacit learning also happened with, you know, multidisciplinary projects and um, working with students from um, furniture design and uh, ceramics, graphics, etc. And then I came uh, to Edinburgh to the UK to do a master's in textiles. This was my solo exhibition that I was very lucky to be offered right after I graduated. Um, and this sort of kind of set the tone. I wanted to set up my practice almost straight away. Uh, and here is a, a, a picture on the steps of the Krauss Council, <laughs> where um, is my cohort of uh, lovely makers and artists. And this is where we began nearly 10 years ago, where we, um, we were all uh, awardees of the Next Move, um, Krauss Council's Next Move Award. And basically the award took me to Bath. So I was given a lovely working space as the artist in residence in, at Bath Spa University um, in exchange for some teaching, but also uh, I got to like really, really hone into my creative voice at this time. This, uh, this over a period of two and a half, three years, I launched my creative practice. I set up a small studio and I began with making these very large scale quills, um, exploring stitch. So here was, I think it was my first exhibition at uh, Ruth and Crafts Center, which amazingly, uh, I am still continuing to work with after all these years. And later this month, um, I'll be sending off work to uh, the forthcoming exhibition called Monochrome, which I'm really, really excited about. And then the move to London happened where uh, once I finished the residency and the, the award program, I moved to London and set up a, a studio here. So let's talk about the business model and what that looked like, you know, back when I started versus what it looks like now. So in the beginning, I was doing literally everything. So I, I was, as I said, making quills. Uh, my product line was quite spread out, like uh, cushions and interior accessories, scarves and maps that slowly kind of um, joined this set of products. And then I was selling it in multiple ways as well. So I was doing shows, open studios, wholesale shows, both in the US and the UK. I was working on sale or return at multiple galleries. I was selling through online stores on, uh, on my own website. I was teaching at the studio uh, and also at a college part-time. I was beginning to work on bespoke commissions. So as you can see, it was, it was so many uh, different strands and kind of spinning multiple plates. This is an example of my scarves, which, which were quite successful. You know, I, um, these were being bought by galleries and stores and people directly um, in addition to my quilts. 
But at some stage I decided, I think it was probably four or five years ago, I decided that it was all a bit too much and I really needed to focus down and cull a lot of parts that were not perhaps working as well for me. Um, so I slowly went down this list of what I can take away to, uh, which would allow me to just focus on the parts that I do, do enjoy working on uh, and that are kind of working for me as well. And then I cut off wholesale shows and SOR and selling through online through different stores, teaching at colleges. I just decided I'd do it in my own studio because it, it gave me a lot of flexibility. Also by this time I was uh, a mother, I became a mother and uh, Again, that posed its own challenges on, you know, the, the sort of time I had available to devote to my work and balancing um, raising two small children. So this is what things look like for me now. Uh, direct sales, I have, I'm only focusing on my open studios, which I'm very happy to say that we would be reopening our doors at Cockpit Arts this summer in the last weekend of June. Um, and I'm hoping to see many of you there. Do come and say hello. Uh, I sell through my website for teaching masterclasses. I made a big pivot last year to, to going online. Um, earlier I was teaching in-person classes at my studio at Cockpit, but um, last June, oh no, so it was last March, when everything just canceled and sort of overnight, my inbox filled with a list of cancellations, I decided to, um, make a big pivot and start teaching online and that has just kind of grown and grown um, and also working on collaborations i'm continuing to do my commissions of bespoke maps whether they are through um, whether they are for private collectors or they are for the public realm uh, i'm really enjoying that uh, part of my practice so all these three things I love working on and in, in return, they, these are all working for me well. And instead of spreading myself thin, doing everything under the sun, I'm now just focusing on a few but rewarding things. Um, and I also wanted to touch upon, you know, um, the criteria I use now for taking a project on, which is, you know, what sort of creative potential does it have? Does it allow me to explore new directions? What sort of impact would it have on the world? Um, and then how my own values are aligned with the kind of work uh, that it would be, or perhaps with the, the client who is bringing the project in. So I think these three are kind of the guiding principles for me for taking on new projects. Um, I also want to briefly touch upon support circles. I mean, as creatives for a lot of the time, we are just working by ourselves, um, often working from home or from my studios and we are, we are fairly isolated. So it's important to to nurture ourselves, to seek out uh, others who, who can become uh, our support structure. So here's some of mine. I mean, my long suffering partner, of course, <laughs> then my close friends, um, my cockpit arts community, the staff, as well as peers at uh, cockpit arts. They are people I would, um, you know, uh, I would go and get feedback from or just bounce off ideas from. Um, and the online community also uh, is an important kind of uh, place for me to test out new ideas, to, to get real time feedback. Um, and then my 
students. So all of these circles, when they come together, make for a space where I feel supported, where I feel uh, that I'm not isolated. And I think it's important to invest in those networks uh, because like I said, you know, being bring our creative selves we are we're probably working away uh, in isolation thinking a lot of the times in our own heads so here are kind of my my six big uh takeaways from my journey so far and the biggest one is that you you have to craft your own journey your own definition of success can be very, very different to what it is to everybody else. It may not even be about turnover. It may not be, it could be just about the kind of life you want to be living in, what sort of time you, you want to spend on making your art, spending time with family. So, you know, the best part about being um, a maker a creative person or an artist is that we get to chart our own course. Um, so the first one is to create your own opportunities. You know, when you don't see anything that you 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 think you might want to apply for, or you've made many applications and nothing is coming through, create something of your own. Curate your own show. Invite your friends and and do a little pop up. Or alternatively, do something on the uh, in the online space. The second is to nurture relationships and yourself. You know, in in running our busy lives and busy practices, we forget that everything is stemming for our, from our own selves. And uh, spinning these multiple plates, we can sometimes get to a point where we feel completely burnt out and we don't want that. We want time to, to kind of regroup, to, to be creative. So allowing time for visiting museums, for example, reading books, looking at inspirational things can, can be hugely nurturing and that, that allows our minds to make connections to come up with new ideas and also to to nurture relationships with people who are invested in you you know that could be the gallery that's offering you a show that could be um, your customers that could be your clients or simply people who are out there and rooting for you the third one is keep showing up. I think there is no shortcut. This is what I've realized. You know, your your uh, business is a verb. It's not a noun. So we have to constantly keep on evolving it, um, pivoting it when it needs pivoting. The fourth is a given. I mean, everyone, every single person um, in the creative sector that I know, they are exceptional in what they're creating. But also just to remember that it's it's for people. Um, then thank people. I think this is such an important one. If you get featured in a magazine, thank them <laughs> and be kind and support your peers, galleries, stores, everybody uh, within the sector, because um, at the end of the day, we are a community. We are a bunch of people who are, who are coming together and making things happen. And it's important to be there for each other. Um, going forward, for me, um, I've just been awarded a fantastic prize by the Crafts Council. It's um, it's called the Cockpit Arts Textile Prize. And I'm hoping to use that time um, and the award money to develop a new body of work for a solo exhibition. Uh, and I'm really, really excited to be at the cusp of starting that journey. And that is it. <laughs> so I'm gonna stop there and return to Rosie. Thank you so much. That was really, really interesting. Um, 
and what a journey. And I love the fact that you um, got the Crafts Council Award those 10 years ago. That's <laughs> right. Now you have your work going into the permanent collection. That's I know, it's, it's <laughs> fantastic. And I am just full of gratitude for all of the support that the Crafts Council has given me over the years, you know, right from kind of that start and through the years. So, yeah, uh, and I was so happy to be invited to that this is my opportunity to give back. <laughs> Thank you so much. That that was just some some really fantastic advice and you know really useful to kind of see how you were making so many different things and and doing so many things and like you say kind of spreading yourself very thinly and about kind of reevaluating as you go on and yeah. and kind of focusing on the things that work and I think that's that's fantastic advice. Um, so I've just got a few questions, um, and the first one is, I mean, you gave some great advice already, but I just <laughs> wanted to there's some um, <laughs> kind of one particular piece of advice that you could um, give particularly to emerging makers right at the beginning point of their um, journeys, really. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think the, the one, the biggest, the most important uh, advice that I could give anybody who's starting on their journey is to embrace it. Embrace being an artist, one, and embrace being a business owner. So I, I don't think they are two mutually contradictory things. Um, they are, the, the way we would run our business, I think as artists, is through so much creativity, whether it is in the, the work that we make, but also how we bring it out in the world, you know, how we market it or how we show it. It comes from a place of great passion. And I feel that um, just embracing the fact that you, you own a creative business can be so liberating because, you know, uh, it, <laughs> we, we may because I've gone through this journey for a long time. I kept thinking, but if I'm an artist, how can I be? How can I be running a business? And uh, I think they they come together in a wonderful way. We just need to to believe that it it's expansive. And the more we invest into our business, the more it allows us to to work in our creative field. Do you see what I mean? So I don't think they're mutually exclusive. Also, I think there's never been a better time. To be starting uh, and the reason I say that having come from that whole journey of having no social media but the only way that you could present your work to the world was through doing craft shows craft fairs or exhibitions but now the all of those still exist but there's this wonderful platform called Instagram and other social media channels where you can take your take whatever you're making today and by the end of the day today you can be putting it out in the world and and saying like look this is what I made so I think that it's possible to connect with your audience instantly uh, which I didn't have when I was starting out so I feel that people who are starting now are in this fantastic position to, to do that and to get feedback to make sales uh, straight away it's just become so easy uh, and also lastly I feel the pandemic although it has been a devastating time for um, businesses all over the world and personally as um, as well you know all of us have been through this really chaotic and distressing time but I think this is the time the world needs art more than ever we need to have beauty in our lives we need to have that connection of somebody's hand having made something and us holding it so i think for all of these reasons anyone who's starting now should feel comforted uh, that they are onto a great thing and they we just have to get out of our own ways basically <laughs> <laughs> and allow good things to happen and, and get out of that mindset of being a starving artist and be a thriving one. <laughs> Definitely. And like you say, social media is such a um, massive, massive opportunity now, isn't it? And so many people, you know, like, like when I started, I didn't have that. And now it's you can just completely control your own marketing. And it's 
Yeah. Uh, you know, it's difficult because it is saturated, but, um, you know, you can put yourself out there and if you put enough work into it, it does take a bit of work, doesn't it? Yeah, um, yeah it's such a wonderful thing. Definitely. Yeah, definitely embrace that. Um, I was just going to talk to you a bit about um, cockpit arts because yes. you're, you're a member there um, and what the benefits that you kind of feel you you've had from being part of a studio collective like that mm. um, um what can i say it's just been wonderful being a part of cockpit arts um <clears throat> so i have been uh, i have had a studio at cockpit since 2015 so it's been a good six years now and i can uh, I can vouch for every single person in that building being absolutely switched on and and working towards making um, supporting all the members that are studio holders. It's a wonderful community of peers. You know, you find uh, that everyone is a creative one. So that sense of being with others who are doing the same thing as you is so important because oftentimes, like I was saying, that it can be so isolating working on your own. And <clears throat> excuse me, once you're out of the uni, where you're, where you're surrounded by creative peers and your mentors are your professors who are again creatives themselves, there is suddenly like this bubble burst, right? <laughs> who do I turn to now? Um, so surrounding ourselves with people who are uh, on similar journeys as ourselves is so important. And Cockpit in particular, this is the only creative uh, incubator in the country for craft-based businesses. So what that means is in terms of mentoring support, in terms of business training, uh, there, there is a universe of um, support programs and available. There is also one-on-one -on -one, uh, mentoring from your business coach, uh, which is, I think, phenomenal you know, to have somebody with that kind of experience and to have um, an objective set of eyes to, to be looking in because we all have close friends or maybe our parents or our siblings or our partners that we, we speak to about our practices on a regular basis, but they are so invested in us <laughs> that sometimes they may not be the best people yeah. uh, to be getting feedback from, for instance. So I think having that is invaluable. Yeah. The, the, the support it allows, but I, I do want to mention the awards and uh, Cockpit has, has several awards for people who are just starting out. Uh, they are in leather, in silver, uh, in textiles, and the newest one is the New Craftsman Award at, Crafts, uh, at Cockpit Arts. And this award has just been announced. The deadline is 27th of May, and it's inviting people who are in early stages of their businesses to uh, apply, particularly from underrepresented groups. Um, and it's a phenomenal opportunity to have a free studio space, to have mentoring, um, you know, someone to handhold you through your journey. So I would encourage everyone to apply <laughs> for a place in Coffee Arts. <laughs> Definitely go for all the opportunities you can. And it, it, yeah, like you say, it's a fantastic incubator, isn't it? And there's all of that support there and being around peers. It's, you know, it's really invaluable. So and also open studios. So twice a year, you open your doors to people. Uh, and this is an audience that is, that is invested in uh, the idea that creative creativity should exist and should thrive. So they are coming there rooting for us and supporting us. So why would you not? I mean, I, I see no reason yeah. to not um, be going for um, a membership at Cockpit Arts. Well, I think definitely. So yeah, check on their website and um, you'll get the full details there. Fantastic. And just lastly, you, you mentioned you kind of work with some quite big name clients there, which I think 
it's very inspiring for a lot of people kind of just um, starting out. And I know everybody's journey to that point is very different. There's no kind of set rules to get there, is there? But um, do you have any tips on kind of making yourself visible or working with those kind of big, big name clients at all? Um, I think my biggest advice, or at least I follow this philosophy that, you know, you you make it and they'll come, right? So you you are building something, you're putting your work out there and the right sort of people who need to be watching are really watching, you know, because um, everybody wants to be working with someone who's genuinely passionate about their work, who's making beautiful work. Um, so it's, it's this thing of continuing to keep going. That's one. And, and a lot of times what happens is when you're not, when you're putting stuff out there, but you're not hearing anything back, whether it's making submissions to galleries or to, um, uh, clients that have a very established name. Um, I think that the key is to continue doing that, to continue, um, if, even if someone has said no, it, it just means that it's a no for, for that particular time. It doesn't mean no forever. You know, you can go back the following year or the following season with a um, new body of work or some new takes on work and, and invite people into your world, right? So um, if you're doing an exhibition, invite that one person that you've been really dreaming of coming and viewing your work. So um, I think it's not one factor, it's several different things. Um, there's, there's, a, uh, there's a lovely artist who I admire uh, uh, hugely and she said this fantastic thing to be. She was like, you know, initially when you're building your practice, it's almost like this, this thing, this rock that you're pu pushing uphill. <laughs> <laughs> right and it feels like so arduous that this is what you're just going and doing and you're putting all of yourself your soul and your heart and your sweat and blood into this thing and then there comes a point you know you've kind of gone over that the biggest biggest impediments and then it starts to gain speed and momentum on its own and you'll find that point comes you know it it's for everyone, it comes at different points. It might come three years in, it might come five, five years in, or it might take a decade to get there. But once it starts rolling on its own, you'll find that, you know, you're not doing the pushing at all. It has gathered a speed of its own and you're sort of just riding the wave, you know? Uh, so <laughs> it's, I, yeah, and I loved that analogy. I was like, yeah, that's how it felt that I was just like, pushing <laughs> and nothing was happening uh, but there there does come a point that it takes um a life of its own and we just gotta keep going till till there and the the big established names will come <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, know what you mean. I think yeah for a lot of makers it can it can kind of become a bit disheartening if you at the beginning when you're just kind of trialing things that I totally get that I have been there <laughs> I have cried tears. <laughs> the reactions you want, and you have an idea of where your work might fit, but they, they yes. don't work yeah, and, they and your, our work is constantly evolving, you know, and as we are evolving, and then all these, the the luminaries that we, you know, when we're starting out, and we we have these people on pedestal, even they are evolving. So I think it's a matter of continuing to make the work that we want to make with authenticity and um, really being able to stand behind it and say that this is what I am and this is what I'm putting out in the world. And I feel that ultimately, like I said, three years, four years, 20 years down the line, it's going to happen. Yeah, just keep authentic and keep true to yourself and keep going. Yes. And yeah, I think that's a great message. Oh, thank you so much. It's been really, really insightful and wonderful to hear all of your, you know, background and, and yeah, it'll be really interesting to see what, what happens next. So I'm excited. <laughs> <laughs> I'm excited to see where this journey leads me. Definitely. Yeah. yeah.
Yeah. <laughs> but I want to wish all the, the people who are starting now the very best of luck and um, I'm, I'm, I'm rooting for them. <laughs> oh, fantastic. Yeah, thank you. That's really, really great. Um, I'm going to stop recording now and say goodbye. Um, but thank you so much. And uh, yeah, thank you. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Bye bye. bye, -bye.